Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's training. I am looking forward to sharing with y'all some of my favorite ways to um, work with photographs so that they make better paintings. The goal of today's session is to dive deeper in how to work from photographs in such a way people can't tell that you've painted from photographs. So lots of us are using reference photos right now. Lots of people use reference photos all the time, but now in particular. And one of the big issues, there are actually three big mistakes that I see people make when they're working with photos, is number one, they use somebody else's photos. So here's the problem with using somebody else's photos. You don't have an emotional connection to it. You haven't been to that place and experienced it so that you have that engagement with the subject. That's gonna come through in the painting, I promise. So you're gonna be 100% better off with a bad photo that's yours, that you took at that place, than somebody else's fantastic photo of a place you've never been to. I strongly recommend working from your own photos. So when I'm teaching courses, I have photos for the demos and I get students to paint along with those so they get the concepts and can submit those in but then say now apply it to your own photo it makes a world of difference in how you absorb the information second big issue when people are working with photos they include way too many excessive details because the photograph recorded a minute amount of detail, sometimes more than your eyeball can see, people feel driven to include it. When the truth is, your painting will work better without all of the extraneous detail. Even in a photograph, when I was teaching students to, to take good photos, one of the first rules is to eliminate extraneous detail so that you don't have the viewer's eye trapped in all of those details and textures. My students used to call those foliage shots. It was their code name for foliage shots. So one of the things I would suggest to them not to do was in their first photos to go out there and take a photograph of a whole bunch of foliage with nothing else in there. Lots of different kinds of foliage because what happens is visual overload, too much pattern, too much texture, too much surface. So you wanna watch out for that, that you're not going down that rabbit hole of trying to give people everything that's in the photograph. The painting's not a photograph and the photograph's not a painting. They're two very different mediums. You're actually better off with a less good photo that doesn't have as many details than the hyper detailed photograph. So don't get stuck in the hyper details. Third issue, I hope y'all can't hear the singing dog back there. Third issue is that when people forget that cameras flatten out the space and the light, the camera can't record, hold on, Scarlet Ann, stop. Singing beauty back there. Um, the camera cannot record the degree of contrast that's actually there in the photo, especially if you've got a strong lighting situation, like you have a sunrise or a sunset, something like that, the camera can only record the accurate light reading for either the sky or the land at that point. It can't do both. Our eyes can. Our eyes make a quick adjustment and shift as we look from one place to the other. Camera can't do that. And so if you're just painting from the photograph, it's gonna look odd. It also flattens out the values. So it can actually make something look really chalky that isn't. And cell phones do that more than regular cameras do. Cell phones, these little things right here are so convenient and the cameras on here are pretty darn good now but they do have some inherent distortions that you don't have in um, DSLRs, the fancier digital single lens reflex cameras. 
those can more accurately capture the color. A cell phone camera is going to blow out, means make it go really light, yellow or white, it's going to blow out the lightest values, for example, in the sunset. Have you ever noticed that when you try to take a photo of a sunset or sunrise, that the pinky orange color that you saw with your eyeballs is yellow in the photograph? It's because of the way it meters the sky. It blows out the color. It's not what you actually saw with your eyeballs. So remember that you want to use your own photos. You want to inc not include extraneous detail. And you want to remember that cameras lie. They lie like crazy. Trust your eyeballs and adjust for what your eyes saw. So here are some of the ways that I use photographs successfully so that people cannot tell whether it's painted from a photo or painted from life. First thing I do is I work from my own photos. I don't work from other people's photos. In fact, I usually flat out refuse to work from other people's photos. I don't like to take commissions from people who want me to paint their photo because I haven't experienced that lighting situation and I don't have any reference in the back of my mind for what I'm looking at. So I use my own photos, even if they're bad photos. I used to intentionally take photos with my old flip phone because it didn't record all the details and it would be slightly pixelated or a little fuzzy. Much better to paint from in actuality. Second thing I do is I take a photo metered for the shadows and for the sky. So I take two of them. And you may not realize, but you can have the phone photo meter for both of those different sections and it'll adjust. So you take two photos, you can do it, and actually some of the cameras will attempt to put it together into one, but I would actually take two photos. So take one photo, and when you are in the photo program, let's see if I can get to that. When you're in the photo program and you're gonna take a photo, if you wanna take a meter reading for an area, tap it with your finger. And that's how you get the camera to take a meter reading in that area. And it'll adjust so that that area is correct. Take the photo, then take a meter reading for the darker area, then take a second photo. That way you'll have one that's correct for each of the sh uh, those areas, the shadows and the highlights. I'm going to show you how to put those two together or adjust that one photo if you're stuck taking one photo. Third thing that you want to do, third thing I do, is I always try to correct for the distortion that comes from smartphone cameras. These things are basically wide angle lenses. And what that does is it makes things that are straight and perpendicular to the earth and tall tilt in like they're 14 story buildings and they don't look that way with your eyes. If you paint them that way, it looks odd. So you have to correct that. It's called parallax conversion. That's a fancy photography term for parallel lines that are coming together. And you know, things that are physically parallel don't come together. So if your telephone poles are starting to look like railroad tracks, you need to do some correction. And I've got an example. I'm going to show you how to do that. Fourth thing. Crop until it hurts. Crop for a strong composition. Don't just paint the photo as it comes out of the camera. Adjust the photo to make sure you're maximizing your composition. Number five, edit out the unnecessary details. Remember I said earlier, that's a big mistake people make is including too many. Edit them out. I'm gonna show you how to do that yourselves in just a few minutes. Take them out. Literally, you can remove them. You can blur them. You can reduce how dominant they are. 
Number six, and this is a really, really important one. I see people making this mistake all the time. But number six is I use the computer monitor itself or my iPad to paint from. I don't paint from a printout. So think what, about what happens when you print out a photo. Unless you've got a couple of thousand dollar printer, what happens is that as you print it out, again, it reduces the contrast, it flattens out the colors, and it's not as rich as it looked on your computer monitor. If you paint from the monitor or your tablet, there's a lot of depth in that color. It looks closer to what your eyeballs saw. So it's really important not to print the photos out. So even if you're, you're working in your studio, you've got the printer there, don't turn it on. Um, you'll get much, much richer color, much greater sense of depth, much greater sense of reality if you're painting directly from the computer monitor, even your cell phone, or from the tablet. So I want to take us through how to do some of these six things, although you know how to paint from your tablet, but I'm going to show you how to do these actual things using software that's free that you can download off of the internet. And I'm going to suggest that you do the photo editing stuff on a desktop or a tablet, not on your smartphone. Your smartphone's little, and it's hard to do delicate work with two fingers on that screen. So while there's an app that will let you do most of that, I think it's easier if you're doing it on your computer. So the piece of software that I recommend, if you've got Photoshop, fantastic, but it's pricey. And there's an alternative out there to Photoshop that's free. And it's Creative Commons licensed. It's safe to download. Lots and lots of people use it. It is free to download. And that piece of software, I'm going to show you the front page of that site, um, is GIMP. Now, the difference between it and Photoshop is the, the interface is not as slick and fancy, but it can do every single thing Photoshop can do, and it's free. And it comes for the Mac, and it comes for the PC. So there's a version out there for all of y'all. So step one is to download it. It's safe to download the software from their site. I've already downloaded um, the latest version onto my computer. But all you have to do is click that button to download it. It will take you over here and you pick your platform that you're on. Are you on the Mac or are you on Windows? Very few of you are going to be using Linux. And then you just download the version that you need and install it. So I've already done that on mine. And I'm going to switch over to GIMP so that y'all can see what it looks like got Photoshop open too and I'll show you the different interfaces and so I think you'll see what I mean by one being a little fancier call it fancy pants um, than the other so um, here is GIMP remember GIMP is free and Sally, you have a Mac, so I think, or at least I remember, thought that you have it a Mac. You don't need Windows. You need to download the version for the Mac if you've got a Mac. And if you have a PC, then download it for the platform that you're working with on the PC. If you're using Linux, there's a version for Linux. If you're using the iPad, then there's a different piece of software that you're gonna, you're gonna use. I still would recommend editing photos on a desktop computer, on a laptop, rather than on an iPad or a phone. So we're gonna go through this one first. So this is the interface on GIMP, and let me open a photo. Let's see if it's gonna let me go back into, let me do one thing here first. I'm gonna drag the photos from one folder to another so that it will see that. For some reason it's not seeing. Um, it's 
not seeing my folder. Oh, I know what it is. It's not seeing my folder of folders, folder of files inside of um, Dropbox. So I'm going to put it on documents for the moment. There, that should do it. So it should be in here. Maybe not yet. I may have just made a mess by doing that. Oh, here it is. Awesome. So the first one that we're going to look at and yes, go on and convert. So this first one is a photograph of the beach down on Edisto in the fall. This is from last October. And it's one that I plan to paint. And remember I talked about removing extraneous details. I'll make sure I go through these in order or at least somewhat in order. Um, let me get the one first that had the shadows that I wanted to move. Going too fast here. So if you've got one that the color is blown out on, and this is an example of that. This was sunrise, and I could see more of the dunes then shows up in this photograph. The photograph is correct, pretty close to being correct for the sky, but it's too dark for the land. So right now, it's not what I saw with my eyeballs. So if I wanted to want to adjust that, then I am going to select the sky first. And I'm going to use the lasso tool to do this. And I'm going to do it kind of quickly and dirtily. But hopefully give y'all an idea of how this works. So I'm going to not worry too much if I overlap some of these things because it's a reference photo. So what I'm trying to do is I'm going to adjust the value and the color for the sky and for the land so it's closer to what I saw with my eyeballs. And I'm doing it quick and dirty here. The tools are the same as Photoshop if you've ever used that. The icons look it's almost exactly the same. They're just not as three dimensional and pretty as Photoshop. Photoshop's a lot slicker, but other than that, it's not going to be any. Oops. I'm going to go back here and collect that. I'm getting a little off there. Photoshop is not any necessarily better than GIMP. It's just fancier looking. So I'm going to let that be as awkward as it is. So I've now selected the sky. And so I am going to adjust the values in there by going to image. And then I'm going to look for levels in there. Let's see where they've gone. I should have pulled some of this up earlier. It's probably going to be in colors. There it is. Levels. Procreate's not for adjusting photos, Kirsten. It's for painting. So it does a different thing. So it's not really the same kind of program. So I'm going to adjust the values in the sky. Do y'all see this little, I think this is going to show for y'all. 
Can you see the levels right here with that little graph? So the graph here, I'm gonna pull the arrows so that for some reason it's not giving me box is too small. I need to see the dark arrow. I can't grab there it goes. So I'm moving the darkest value to where that graph starts. And then I'm going to move the lightest one a little bit to the left to lighten it up to closer to what I saw with my eyeballs. It's a little bit overblown, but not much. So that adjusts that section, I'm going to say. Okay. And then I can invert that selection. So I've selected the sky right now. If I go over here to select and click invert, I'm going to select the land. Hopefully, it's looking a little funky there. But we're going to test it and see if it did correctly. And so then we're going to go in and adjust the values for the land. And we can see that it's all blown out because it's not as light as it should be. Take that down to where, and that's a little too light. It looks like broad daylight. But adjust and tweak it until it looks closer to what you saw with your eyeballs. And click OK. Now, because it's a reference photo, it wouldn't matter that you've not sat there and picked all the little bits in between the cedar tree. I wouldn't worry about that. You're trying to adjust the value relationship so it's closer to what you saw with your eyes. Does that make sense to y'all so far? Everybody with me so far? That's how you would adjust two different lighting situations in the same photo. So you're adjusting for the sky and then adjusting for the land. And it doesn't have to be fancy pants. You don't have to go in there and select every little thing. You get a better vision of it just by being that quick with it because you're not trying to recreate the perfect photo. You're trying to get a good reference. Awesome. I love that y'all are, are still with me on that. So if that's what you're going to set, you're going to work from, I would go to file and do save as. So your original stays the same and you're going to create a copy of it. And I usually keep the original name and add something into it like adjusted or corrected. So I know what it is. And for the format, it's saving as an XF file, but you can save it as a JPEG too. So that should work. Let's see. I'm gonna see if it will let me do. Like it's going to pick its own format. So that'll work. And then we're going to save it. So that's how to do that first situation where you've got a different situation in the sky, in the highlights, and a different situation in the shadows, in the lights and the shadows. So that was number one. Number two, actually, it was number two. Number one was to work from your own photos. Number three, is to correct distortion that happens in smartphones. So in that one, let's see which one that is. Here we go. Come on, open up. Oh, it's partially open. There we go. 
So this is the lane behind my house. There's a lane, there are lanes in Savannah that go between the blocks. It's where all the trash cans and stuff go. Very mundane kind of subject in a lot of ways, but we get beautiful light back there. So I've been planning to paint this one for a while and I can still set my easel up that, back there and be socially distant. But I want you to notice one thing here. Look at this telephone pole. This is a power pole. Now, if it were really at that angle, it would fall down on this garage, my neighbor's garage right here, which is not also not leaning in at an angle like that. That is the distortion, that wide angle distortion um, that you get from um, cell phones. So Kathy, you can't see the menu and the levels when I slide them. I'm gonna switch at the format then to um, my whole messy window so that you can see those on the next one. So let me switch that right now to the whole messy window. There we go. So what we were gonna wanna do is to adjust for that distortion. So the first thing you're gonna do is select everything in here. And you can do that with the keyboard command, Command S, I mean, Command A. Get the wrong thing going there, cancel. Select everything, select all. And that should have everything it does. Everything is selected there. Let's zoom out just a little bit here. There, now you can see the whole selection. So select it all, and then we're gonna transform it. And that is a little bit different place than Photoshop. So let me grab it right here. Right here under select, you see distort click distort and what that does is it allows you let's see if it's gonna it's loading things because i just downloaded this it was a little confused um I'll go back and do that again should give me the handlebars And for some reason, it's not doing it. Let's see if I can make it do the correct thing. Oh, she's singing again. Scarlet. Oops, clicked the wrong thing. I don't know why it's not giving me the right thing. I think because I just installed this, there it doesn't have everything loaded in here. Maybe I can get it with that. It's not going to let me grab it. Dang it. I knew I should have checked that first. Having a hard time pulling up the correct thing. But as, as soon as I start trying to demonstrate it, then I can't find the correct stuff. Here we go. Transform tools. That's what I wanted. I'm going to warp it. That should. Come on, thing. It's not doing it. So I'm going to have to play with that one. Darn it. <laughs> Sally, it's not too hard. It's just I, don't, I just downloaded the new version and I was bad. I did not check it before I got started there. 
it's not, there we go. So now I got the handlebars. Okay. Now we're in business again. So you need to pick perspective and you can see how I'm dragging that corner. And by dragging that corner, the telephone pole is getting taller. Well, it's getting straighter. We'll put it that way. Now watch that you don't do it too much and the telephone poles here in the background start leaning the wrong way. And then over here, let's see if I can get that to disappear out of the way. We'll do this one by dragging the other direction. There we go. Now it's getting straighter. See how now the garage is straightened up? Now the other thing that you're gonna to wanna to do is pull it down a little bit as well because it squinches things down in your photograph, in the original photograph. So it gets a little bit distorted every which way but loose. Um, Sally, if I wanted to keep the tree in there, say I wanted everything that was in the photo originally to stay in the photo, then I need to drag more on the bottom so that it doesn't leave the composition. Does that make sense? So that would be what I would do is adjust it that way. Does that make sense there? You just grab the diamond and drag it until you've got it straightened up. Then you can crop it. So once it's where you want it to be, click transform. And it takes it a second and then it's adjusted. Then I would crop it to get rid of the um, excess along the edges. Remember I said crop until it hurts. So after I correct that distortion, this is what I'm really interested in painting. I don't know that I'll include the garage in there. If I do a square, I might simplify the garage down. Remember what I've said about looking for the extraordinary and the ordinary? This one I'm really drawn to as a vertical. So this is the composition that I'm planning on working from, right there. And so now the telephone poles and the trees aren't distorted and I've cropped it to improve the, comp the composition, all using the free software. And then again, I would save as so that I'm not getting rid of my original. And I would save it with a slightly different name, like corrected. So that gets us to the cropping and correcting for distortion. Now our next one, the next little fun thing to adjust, and this is one of my favorite things to do, is to edit out the unnecessary details. So what you're doing there is to, let me get that off. I'm gonna go and open another one. Oh, actually, I think I have it open already. It's right here. So this is the one of the beach. And the reason that I want to edit out the detail here is that as the photograph stands right now, um, and let me go back, Virginia has a question that fits in, into that last one. Virginia says, could you have cropped first? Here's why I wouldn't crop first. Because when you crop first, everything else is going to ch change and shift as you correct. So the main reason I pulled that one in was so you could see how you would correct that, those distorted parallel lines. Um, you might wanna leave those in. So I was using that photograph to demonstrate two things, but I would not crop until I'd corrected any parallel lines. 
because you can't tell where that square is going to end up being until you've done that correction. You're going to end up with the trapezoid. So you want to correct for the distortion before you crop. This one I wouldn't crop very much at all. Um, it's, it works to me as it is with the removal of a few details here. So one of the things I would do to crop on this one would be, there are a couple of little things I would do. So we have it selected so far and we're gonna crop it. Let me go down here and give us more on the screen. So what I would probably do is move that point of land out of the middle. It's a little too close. The spit of land is a little too close to the center. I put it there and then I would crop. Now, where's the focal point as it stands right now? The focal point is the little man right here. And why is he the focal point, Sally Booth? Because he is the brightest. He's where the contrast is, his bright red fishing t-shirt. It's too dominant. It makes him the focal point. And I don't want him to be the focal point in my painting. So I'm going to totally get rid of him. I am going to erase him with a magic tool called the clone tool. And so with the clone tool, I can make him and his little yellow bucket disappear so that instead of the focal point being right here, I'm going to make the focal point be right here. So in order to do that, I got to remove Mr. Red Shirt. He's too dominant otherwise. And it's going to be hard to paint and forget that Mr. Red Shirt is there. So to do that, I'm going to look at the paint, the photograph larger. So I can focus in on Mr. Red Shirt. And this is Photoshop magic. Over here, there's a tool and I'm gonna circle it with the red here. This looks like a little stamper right here. That's the clone tool. It's just a little stamping tool. And when you use that tool, and we're gonna switch to it, and it'll tell you what it will do. If you roll your mouse over it, it'll tell you what that tool does. So that's the clone tool. And we're gonna selectively copy from the image. So I'm gonna copy the sand next to it and then move the clone tool across him and it's gonna erase him. He is gonna go bye-bye. So I'm gonna hold down the option key and click here. And that's going to copy the sand where I just put that tool. And then I'm going to erase over here. And that should, it's not doing it now. Whoops. Salad. Oh, Ann says, I've been told that people always become the focal point when they're in a painting. And do I, yes, they do. That's one reason I want him out of there. Um, because he's the focal point right now. Even if his shirt weren't bright red, he'd be the focal point. But with it being bright red, oh, he is just like a massive, massive focal point. So I am just gonna see if I can make it do right. It is not cooperating. It's gonna be a different pattern. Let's see if it's what I'm doing wrong there. If I grab right here, ah, it's grabbing that. I know what I did now. So let me go back over here and switch the tool again so that I get back to it. So I just circle around over here. 
grab that area and then come over here and that should do it. Option key it. It did it when I didn't intend to and now it's making another one of him. How did I do that? Go back up here and undo. Somehow managing to grab the wrong thing. Okay, thing I know I need to set, it's asking me to set the original image first. So I'm gonna pull from over here. And it's not, I'm gonna have to stick the instructions into the thing and edit that out because this is not cooperating as soon as I demo. It's like when I can't spell when I'm on the chalkboard in the classroom should grab that and then do it and it's not so i should be able to erase him like that so i am going to have to fix that and edit that into the video there you can paint the painting and eliminate him in your mind but the problem with doing that is that you're going to focus on it and it's a lot easier if you can eliminate that so here i'll show you what i mean I'm going to go to that photograph. And we're going to grab our beach scene. Okay. So this is how it works. Well, that is big. It's kind of big, but it's, it'll work. Make it a little smaller. So Mr. Red Shirt is now going to disappear. and his little bucket stuff too. And even get rid of a slight bit of person right there. And then it looks radically different without the person in there. So that's why I like to do it, Sally, is that you can get rid of a distraction as you're painting. You're gonna keep being pulled back to the red shirt as you're trying to paint. If you remove it out of the photo, then it's easier to focus on where the focal point actually is, which is in this area over here. So does that make more sense? Yeah, it is more peaceful, Kathy. It's a lot more peaceful. It's a whole different photograph without Mr. Redshirt in there. When he's in there, it becomes like a little slice of life and a vignette kind of thing. That's fine. But if you're trying to focus on the landscape and that's the main subject, then you don't want the red shirt in there. Yeah, it, it's amazing how much mental space that frees up because now you're not having to, in your mind, every time you look at it, go, no man with red shirt, no man with red shirt. You can just paint what you see. Remember that as you're painting, every decision you can eliminate from the process of painting means you're going to paint more in flow. That's why when we go through the five day challenge, we talk about all of the different habits that set you up for success. And if you can correct the photos as much as possible before you start painting, they're going to look, the painting itself is going to look better because you're going to be in flow while you're working. That's why that's important. So that was the main, the, the main things, those were the main things that I wanted to show you how to do. 
And you can do most of those same things on here, on your tablet or on your phone with an app called Snapseed. So I'm gonna switch out of this one now and show you where to find Snapseed. Go to Chrome. Snapseed is also free. It comes from Google. And Snapseed is in the App Store for the Mac OS, for Apple, and for Google Play. Um, Sally, you can't make it work. What trouble are you having with it? What are you trying to get it to do? Well, the way you're going to learn to do it, Sally, is you're going to play this video over again with whatever the software is that you're going to work with because it's going to be a whole lot easier to learn it if you're following along. So if you follow along with the video, then you can make it do it. So they want to get, they want you to put a password in. That is probably that in order to download it, you have to enter your password into the App Store. That's just the way the App Store works. That's not Snapseed, that's the App Store. So Snapseed can do almost all of those things that we just went over. Um, Procreate can do a lot of them as well. See if I can make mine pop Snapseed up for just a minute. I like to use Snapseed on my iPad instead of my phone, but um, it does. Snapseed doesn't ask for a password, Sally. What's asking for a password is the App Store. Um, so it's just the App Store is not letting you download it without entering your password into the App Store. The first thing it'll ask you when you download it is if it can have access to your photos and you just say, okay. And it wants access to the camera and you just have to allow those things. And then you can open a photo in there and you can adjust the photos on your device just like we just talked about. So I'll open one and just to take a second to open it. So I can open and let me share the, stop sharing the screen there for a minute. I can open any photo that's on my photo app and I can go through and edit it and correct things on there. So I can, like for example, in this one, I can adjust the reflection in the window so that it's lighter or darker. But I can play around with it and I can play with the same basic tools. It's got selection tools. It's got um, tools for adjusting the, the levels, just like I talked about. It calls it tuning the image. It's got a crop tool that you can use, and it's got some basic tools that will heal, do what they call heal, which is kind of like the cloning. So it can do all of those things. But again, like I said before, I would really strongly recommend that any photo editing you do, you do on your computer, not on your, your mobile device. Look at it on a mobile device, but don't try editing photos in little itty bitty form. Tracy says she has Photoshop Express. And you'll have all the tools that I've shown in Photoshop and it's relatively easy to do. The, it has the clone tool, depending which version you've got. Um, it has all of those things that I showed you there. It might be in a little bit different place, Tracy, but it'll be there. So let me ask you um, any questions, anybody in there. So my advice when you want to learn how to do it is to download GIMP onto your computer and then walk through step by step. And I'll get the GIMP directions for the clone tool in there. I'll edit this video and pop them in there too. 
but go through and um, then you can go step by step and make sure you understand how to do it. You can rewind and then fast forward, rewind and fast forward. It works better. I think that's the easiest way to learn how to do that stuff. And there, as um, I think it was Kathy said, there are also lots and lots of YouTube videos on how to work those programs. I don't want you to dive deep into photo editing. You could go down a rabbit hole that would keep you there forever. I just want you to be able to adjust the photographs that you're working from with those really basic tools. Some of that you can even do in your photo app on your phone. You can control the exposure and the contrast and the cropping all within your photo app. What the, the same thing that stores your photographs without any other special apps to download. So let me go back through here and answer any questions that people have. Sally Booth says, <laughs> First, you're laughing at my dog's name. Yes, her name is Scarlett, and she is one of the only dogs I've ever given a middle name to because she is silly, and she is Scarlett Ann when she's being bad. And so she was in there singing, and that makes her stop. She knows when she gets the Ann in there that she is being annoying. Um, she's a silly dog, smart but silly. What kind of camera do I recommend? I love Nikons. So if you're gonna get a DSLR, I highly recommend Nikons, any of them in the 5000 series. That I think they're up to 5400 now. Um, I have a 5200 that I bought two, four or five years ago, maybe six years ago, and it still works beautifully. So those are a good investment. If you can wait until Black Friday, Amazon always has really good sales on those. Watch for, although there are probably some good ones right now too. But Nikon cameras are fantastic. Canons are good too, but I think Nikon makes the best um, digital cameras. Uh, Procreate, I've got, I use it on my iPad. I use it mainly for drawing. You can do some adjustments to the photographs in there too, Kirsten. Um, and for some people, I think it's easier than some of those other tools. But there's some things you can't do in Procreate. It's really more of a painting program than it is a photo editing program. So it's meant for you to create images in, not to so much correct the photograph. But you can do a lot of stuff with it. Love that y'all hang hung in there with that. Awesome. Yeah, as Kathy says, I always make sure to save this as a copy or file save as because I do not ever want to ruin the original photo. Keep the originals and always save the copy in order to do any changes or corrections you do to them. That way you've got the originals. Um, yeah, it does make a really big difference. Sally is saying, is it that small a print in real life? I'm not sure what you mean there, Sally. Um, the photo, all those photographs are pretty big, so they'll print out large if you want to print them out. But again, I don't recommend printing photos out to paint from. I would paint from the screen. That will make it so much better. Yes, Sally, Scarlett is definitely talking to me. She's lobbying for dinner early and it's not happening. You don't need the full Photoshop. You just need to learn how to do a couple of things. If you can correct for the distortion, because that's a biggie. I'm gonna talk about that again in a minute, why it's such a biggie. It's a huge, huge, huge one. If you can do that, forget the rest of it, you'll be golden. Um, that to me is the, that and cropping are the two most important things. And here's why the distortion one is super important. If you don't correct for distortion, people will be able to tell you painted from a photograph. It's a good example. 
um, years ago when I was still the art critic for the newspaper and some of the magazines in the Southeast. There was a professor at one of the universities who had an exhibition of paintings and she was trying to paint hyper realistically. But she was painting from photographs that had been taken with a cell phone photo. And there was a lot of distortion in them and she didn't correct for the distortion. So all of her figures, the people, were as distorted as those telephone poles were. And I looked at it and I asked her, are you trying to paint realistically? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I'm looking at it and the figures are all contorted and distorted because she hadn't corrected the photograph. Uh, people can tell when you've done that. And if you want things to look realistic, then you wanna correct for that distortion so that it, it's not that wide angle view that has anything tall tilting in because it'll do that to people too. It'll make them look like they're pinheads if you're not careful. And it really, really messes up the, um, really messes up the hands and feet in particular. Kathy says in Photoshop, I use skew. That will definitely work in um, correcting that, that perpendicular, the parallel lines, the convergence. Uh, I like to use distort instead of skew. Skew corrects the whole thing at one time. And I found it's not always, it doesn't always, both sides need to be dragged in the same way. And the other thing is when you do distort, you get to control each one of those anchor points in the selection. And that works so beautifully. Um, yeah. So adjust those photographs and they'll look like your, what your eyeballs saw. And remember to crop after you do any distortion correction. And yes, I agree, Anne, that people always become the focal point. So let me see. Yeah, Tracy says, I need to spend more time adjusting my photos. At the moment, I just crop them. Just add one thing in there, Tracy, and just do the, the distortion correction, and that's gonna make a big, big difference. So that'll make a huge, huge, big difference. Yes, and Snapseed is for the phone or the tablet. It's not for the desktop. Phone or the tablet, not the desktop. So that's why I've got two things. They're both free. But Snapseed's for the phone or the desktop, and GIMP is for the computer, or Photoshop Elements, if you've got that, or Photoshop. Yeah, Photoshop Express is, Photoshop Express is a little bit different. It's on the phone and the iPad as well, and the thing about Photoshop Express is it doesn't have all of the same tools. I don't think it has the ability to do the distortion correction correction, Tracy. Um, it did originally, but Adobe has taken out a lot of the tools that were in there. So it's, it's a really, it doesn't do that much more than the photo app itself can do. I don't think it can correct the distortion. So check that out, but I'm not sure. I haven't used, and I think I took it off my phone because it couldn't do what Snapseed did. Um, if, if the photo quality is reduced, that's probably Photoshop Express doing that. Um, again, it's not my favorite app. I, I love Photoshop and a Photoshop Elements is a great piece of software for the desktop. Photoshop Express is just there trying to make you lust after Photoshop. Snapseed's a better app than Photoshop Express. Um, yeah, Denise says she has the D5600 from Nikon. That's an awesome camera. And it can do everything you want it to do. It can shoot video and it can shoot photographs. So the one I have is a D5200 and so it's a, a little bit older, but still takes great photographs. So Anne says, when you edit your photo, do you lose resolution? You don't if you're doing it on the desktop, 
and you don't if you're doing it with Snapseed. Um, some of the other apps will indeed change the resolution. She says, I'm asking because of photoing paintings and needing to crop them some and I don't wanna lose the resolution. I would crop those in GIMP or in the photo app. If you're cropping them in the photo app, you're not gonna be losing resolution. When you take the photo of the painting, get as close up to the painting as you can so that there's less that you have to crop off and then it's not gonna to become too small. Um, Beverly has Photoshop Elements. It's a good program. It works a lot. Yeah, and Tracy says distortion's really obvious in interior photos. Yes, it really is because you've got corners and edges of geometric shapes and they, they look really, really odd. So that will help. Awesome. Lisa says, can GIMP adjust the colors in photos of paintings? Yes, it can. It can do the photo, um, the color correction just like um, Photoshop can. So yes, you can definitely do that. Uh, she says, when I take a print out photos of my work, the colors look different, perfect on my screen, but the colors are different when I print them out. That is a printer problem. That is that your printer is not calibrated or rather your computer's not calibrated for the printer. They have to have the same color profile so that they're speaking the same language. They, they have to speak the same color language. And you've got to tell the, the computer what the profile is of the printer in order for it to match up. So it's not a problem with your printer it's, or the computer, it's just you gotta match those profiles up. So Kathy says, is there a formula to format a picture size to a painting size? For example, making a photo that's five by seven to an eight by 10. Um, let me show you how I do that. It's a good question. So I'll go to GIMP for that. So going back, to um, Mr. Redshirt here. So this one is, let's see what size it is right now. It is 4,000 pixels by 3,000 pixels. Three, by, three to four is the ratio here. So it's not a five, but most photographs are the three to four proportion. And so you can adjust from that ratio. I like to do it by setting one size, the, the shortest size to the size of the new size and then cropping the other one. So there, there's not really a formula you just end up with kind of creating a method. So if I want to resize this, I think I'm gonna go here. So right now it is, and it's in pixels. So it is, I'm gonna, go, uh, I'm gonna say, I wanna switch it from the three to four ratio to um, an eight by 10 would be four to five. So if I want the, I have to go to the height, I want that to be, no, I do have to go to the short one. So if I want the height to be the four, generally we'll do it into the proportion. It's three right now. I'm gonna take it down to a multiplier of four, which is gonna be um, 28. And so it's automatically resized the width there. And I'm gonna say scale. In other words, resize. Now, if I wanna crop it so that it's in proportion, now I've got the short side adjusted. And it means it's gonna be 
not as long. So this is at 28, which is four times seven. And so this other side is gonna be five times seven, which is gonna to have to be 35. I think I did that wrong. Nope, I did it right. So it's gonna crop somewhere. And I'm gonna to have to decide where I want it to crop. So I'm going to probably crop more off the right hand side. I'm gonna drag this, oops, drag that over to 35. You have to do the math if you're gonna resize things. And then I'm gonna crop it, crop to selection. Now it's resized to fit an eight by 10. It'll be in proportion to the eight by 10. So I hope that made sense there, Kathy. But I always size the shortest size side to a multiplier to the ratio of the short number and then do the longer number. Sally, you can't use GIMP on your iPad because it's not created for mobile. I don't believe they have an app for mobile. You can look and see, but I don't think they do. I don't think it's available. And one magic keyboard command on the desktop for any program is Command Z. It's undo. Yeah, Tracy, I think you'll love Snapseed. I've used it for years and years and years. Um, you can adjust Virginia for any of the printers as long as you tell the, the program what printer you're using. Mike says he uses an old version of Serif Photo Plus 9. I feel sure it has something in there that will help you sort out the distortion, for sure. Now, Art Grid is a whole, that's a whole different thing there, Tracy. Art Grid will let you resize it into proportion and lay a grid on top. Um, it's good for figuring out proportions and shifting the photograph so that it's gonna be in the correct proportion. It's a really quick little app to use, um, but it's not gonna let you do any other really real corrections. It's just gonna do the cropping to the appropriate proportion thing, but it's great for that. So great questions, y'all, and I hope this has been helpful. And if you don't take anything else away, what I want you to think about doing, let me stop sharing there. What I want you to think about doing is number one, always crop. Number two, correct that distortion. If you do those two things, you're gonna be so much further down the road than most other people out there. And people won't be able to tell as easily that you're working from photographs. So as Tracy was saying, if you're working on an interior from a photograph, you really need to correct that distortion. If you've got any geometric shapes in the landscape, you really need to correct that distortion. If you're working with a human figure, you really need, and it's close up, you really need to correct that distortion. So let me know if y'all have any questions around that. And I'm so glad it's been helpful. Awesome, Anne. So I will have this up, or rather, Carson will have this up and Stephanie will have this up into the membership shortly. And I'm also gonna try and give y'all a um, transcript as well. So awesome sauce, I'm glad that is helpful. So go for the free apps first because they really can do the job. There's no need for you to go buy Photoshop itself. Other things can do it equally well. Happy painting, everybody. Remember, stay safe, wash your hands, and paint on. Talk to you soon.